Hey everyone, welcome back to Map 256. This is Scott. Let's get started. So last, uh, last video, we learned what differential equations were. We learned how to check proposed solutions to a differential equation and how to solve initial value problems and boundary value problems. But what we didn't learn was how to actually produce the solutions of any differential equations ourselves. So that is a project we start, uh, we will start working on now. Section 1.2, this is going to be the first category of differential equations that we'll actually learn how to solve. And these are what are called separable differential equations. So separable. Separable uh, differential equations. All right, so first off, here's, here's the idea. So, uh, so a differential equation is separable if it can be put into the form And the form is going to look like this. We're going to have something or other here times dy dx, or dy dt, or dx dt, whatever the variables are, equals something or other over here. And this only involves y. And this, or sorry, uh, so I guess I said uh, dy dt here. This only involves t. So this, this part in here can only involve a y, and this part over here only involves a t. All right, if it can, if it can be put into this form, then we can uh, we can complete what is called separating the variables by uh, by actually rewriting this uh, this differential quotient here dy dt with the dy and the dt actually separated. So then we can separate. the variables. So then what we'll have is something or other over here, dy equals something or, over he something or other over here, dt. So you haven't really seen the differentials like this, just, uh, just footloose and fancy free all by themselves. You've only up till now seen them typically uh, either as part of a quotient to make a derivative or else as part of an integral. So you, uh, you end an integral with a dy or a dt. Uh, you need some sort of a, a differential element in there. And that is actually the thing that happens next here. Then, then we can integrate. Integrate. Uh, and then what will happen is there will be a constant of integration on both sides but we can essentially just uh, just collect it, them both on the side that has the t. So uh, consolidate, let's say. Consolidate the constants of integration. on the side with t and solve for y. 
And as we do this, as we do this process, as we solve this for y, uh, we're going to get a sequence of um, we're going to get a sequence of expressions that may or may not still be constant. Each time the constant of integration produces an expression that is still, in fact, a constant, we will typically just continue calling it a uh, an arbitrary constant. So uh, we'll, we'll see what that means as we try some examples. So let's actually try some examples. So just some examples. Solve. Solve the following. Uh, either differential equations, or sometimes they'll also be um, uh, initial value problems. All right. So let's start with one that is uh, like this. So let's say what we have is x squared dx plus y cubed dy equals zero. Okay, so this is pretty close to already being separated. All we need to do is effectively move one of the two expressions to the other side. And I'll move the x's to the left. So x squared, oops, I said I'd move the x's to the left. And I'm a man of my word, so here we go. So y cubed dy is equal to negative x squared dx. So that's it rewritten now. And then we can uh, we can integrate. And this, by the way, this is the hard part of this process. Typically, when um, we, if there is a hard part, it is in the integration. Integration sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's less easy. And uh, here we don't have anything too complicated to worry about. They're just both power functions, but uh, but occasionally you have to uh, dust off some of your old favorite tricks from the world of integration, including, but not limited to, integration by parts, partial fractions, uh, all those kinds of things. So here we didn't have anything too, uh, too, too messy to deal with. It's just a simple power function, which uh, the rule for integrating that is just the reverse of the rule for uh, differentiating it. So essentially differentiating, you divide, or sorry, you, you bring the power down by one and you multiply by the power, by the previous power. Here we just do the opposite. We add one to the power and instead of multiplying, we divide by what would be the new power. And here ordinarily we'd have a plus C, but uh, but we'll just wait and we'll, we'll leave, uh, we'll put all the plus c's on this side over here. Okay, and now what do we have over here? Negative one third, x to the third, and here we have the plus c1. I'll just call it c1 because I'm planning on there being a sequence of, uh, of constants here as we go through the motions. All right, so I put the, uh, so, so I consolidated the constants of integration all on the right here, the, the side that has the the independent variable. And now I would multiply both sides by four. And multiplying a constant by four is still just gonna produce another constant. So I'm just gonna go ahead and call that uh, C2. And if you need to be explicit about it, it would be C2 equals four C1. So uh, so I just renamed my constant. Anytime I do something that turns a constant, an arbitrary constant into another arbitrary constant, I won't usually write things like four times C, I would just call it C2. Okay, and now I'll take the fourth root of both sides or the one fourth power, whichever way you wanna look at it. And the important thing about this is that the constant of integration here is within within the exponent or the root, however you are uh, however you are expressing it. 
Okay. And then once it comes to the very end, once it comes to the very end, we will just uh, we'll just forget about the fact that this was the second in a sequence of arbitrary constants, and we can just write y equals negative four thirds x to the third plus c. Doesn't really matter to us what the what the prehistory was of that arbitrary constant. Arbitrary is arbitrary. Okay, so that's the way uh, that's the way it goes in a case like this. It didn't require anything too fancy on our part. Uh, just a little bit of uh, just a little bit of power. The power rule. Now let's try uh, let's try another one. Let's try y prime is equal to x squared over y times 3 minus x cubed. And we'll throw in an initial condition here, y of 0 is equal to uh, is equal to 4. All right. Well, let's just see where uh, where the process takes us here. So first off, this is not written in the standard format of Leibniz notation. So I'll write dy dx. Now my goal here is I need to find a way of manipulating this so that all the y's are on one side, all the x's are on the other. And, I, and by the way, the only tools available to us in this are multiplication and division, because otherwise uh, we won't have an entire factor of dy on the one side and dx on the other. So it has to be multiplication and division only. So in particular here, if I just multiply both sides by y and I multiply both sides by dx, that will be effectively cross multiplying and leaving us y dy is equal to uh, over here, what have we got? We've got uh, x squared over 3 minus x to the third dx. Okay. And now, if I... Uh, so now if I look at this, I can uh, I can now integrate both sides. Never feel good about seeing those differentials just floating around until they're eventually clothed in a decent integral. Minus dx, okay. So the left-hand side, no issues there. That's uh, that's a nice, easy integral. Uh, plus c, but I'll save that and do it on the, uh, and I'll just consolidate all the constants of integration on the right. For this side, we have to remember the rules of integration that we have for uh, for doing this, and we can remember. That we've got a uh, that we've got a good situation here for a u substitution. So if I make u equal to three minus x to the third, then I can see how um, I can see how the derivative of this is essentially the same thing as the uh, as the numerator, just with an extra factor. But I can deal with that. So then du. So then du would equal negative uh, 3x squared, which is a lot like the top of this expression. So if I want to, uh, uh, yeah, forget about that. So if I, so I don't know what your favorite way of doing this is. I know a lot of people like to just solve for the dx, plug that in, and let things cancel. Uh, my preferred thing would be to solve for the thing I can see in the original expression. So that means that x squared dx, which I can see as the numerator of the original uh, integral here. 
I can see that that would be negative one third du. And so what's that going to leave me? That is going to put me at uh, the integral of negative one third over u du as my new integral and then in the transformed coordinates. And then this is just going to be equal to negative one third natural log of the absolute value of u plus c, uh, c1, And then if I, uh, but u was my invention, there was no u in the original problem, so this isn't quite, uh, isn't, this isn't quite finished yet on the integration side. We need to restore the original variable that the problem had in the beginning, which was of course the x. So that's going to be natural log absolute value 3 minus x to the third uh, plus c1. All right, and now, oh, negative one, two. And now, if, uh, if I want to uh, solve this for the y, I'll have to multiply both sides by two and take a square root. Okay, so what's that gonna give us? So that's gonna be y squared is equal to negative two thirds, the natural log, three minus x to the third, plus c2, if you must cover your tracks here, uh, or cover your bases, c2 is equal to two times c1. This, uh, this is a thing that people wouldn't usually be so, uh, so fastidious about, but if you, uh, but if you, if you wish to be, it is, uh, it is available for you here. Um, Oh, by the way, uh, at this point, I think, uh, let me check this. I think I need to, uh, I'll just check in a second. I think that might need to be a negative. Uh, I made just a modification to a pre-existing um, example, and I might have, a, might have set myself up here for failure by making something impossible. Uh, we'll see. We'll see if I need to, uh, if I need to adjust that. Uh, no, actually, it should, be, it should be fine. It should be fine. Okay. So we'll see. So then y equals the square root of negative two thirds natural log three minus x to the third absolute value plus the mystery constant c2. Now, the, the, this is an initial value problem. So we are not content to leave it as a family, a general solution like this, an infinite family of different, uh, different possible solutions, one for each value of the parameter here. But instead, we are going to need to, um, to actually find the specific value that makes this happen. All right, so y of 0 equals 4. That's the condition that we are told. So 4 is equal to the square root of negative 2 thirds natural log of 3 plus c2. x equals 0. So that means that we're going to have a natural log of 3. It doesn't, we don't have to write an absolute value anymore since we actually know it's, we know it's, uh, its value and its value is positive. And so then if I want to solve this for C2, I can get, uh, I can square both sides and I'll get 16 is equal to negative 2 thirds natural log 3 plus C2. And so C2 is equal to 16 plus 2 thirds natural log of 3. Now then, if you wanted a, an approximate value for that, it could be uh, it could be had, but it's not really it doesn't really make a big difference. So then, uh, so then that gives us uh, y is equal to the square root of negative two thirds 
natural log absolute value three minus x to the third uh, plus sixteen. plus two-thirds natural log of three. Uh, if you wanted to get extra fancy with this and use properties of logarithms and whatnot to combine a couple of the expressions here, be my guest. There's not really much, uh, much advantage to that, so I'm not going to do it. However, uh, I, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't dream of telling you that you couldn't. Okay, so that's how that one goes. And now let's, uh, let's try another. This one is going to involve a little bit trickier algebra to begin with, but other than that, it's, uh, it's not gonna be so, uh, so different. So y prime is equal to one over, and we're gonna have t y plus two t. Uh, plus y plus 2. Okay, so first things first, it, uh, it's easier if we write this in Leibniz form, dy dt. Now, when we look at the right-hand side, at first, it may look unpromising, but Oh, oops, um, make these uh, threes. I wanted this to be similar to a problem in your homework, but I accidentally made it exactly the same. Uh, plus three. Okay, make those threes. Okay, so, so spoiler alert, this is very, very similar to a problem in your homework. I just wanted to, wanted to use that as a template so you would know how to do it. I accidentally, though, put the exact problem in. So you'll have to figure out how to do it with threes instead of twos if, uh, if you can. But anyway, so now we look at this right side, and again, like I said, it's not very promising looking on the project of getting everything that involves y separated from everything that involves t. For one thing, we've got four terms in the, in the denominator there, and there's basically every combination of t's and y's uh, in play. But Let's think about this for a second. So let's just do a little scratch work here. Ty plus 3t plus y plus 3. When you look at that, there's definitely uh, there's definitely some pattern to this. And in particular, you can um, you can see that it's actually this is to that as this is to that. You can actually uh, factor a t out of the first two terms. And what you have is exactly the same as the last two terms. So this is what's called factoring by grouping. It's one of the factoring techniques you, you may have seen at some point in your math education. So what you have here is t times y plus 3, which is the same as, or, or plus 1 times y plus 3. So in a way, we can look at this as having a common factor of y plus 3, which we can pull out. And when we pull it out, we have t left of the first first uh, first bundle here, and we have a one from the second bundle there. So it's t plus one times y plus three. And so then when we rewrite this, we're going to have uh, we can rewrite it as t plus one y plus three. All right. Well, so be it. Now, what happens next is, uh, the, the, is that the variables can now finally be separated. You essentially need things to be factored into a way where on one side of the equation, all the factors, um, all the factors are, are segregated as to whether they include a y or a t. Okay, so now I can multiply both sides by y plus 3, multiply both sides by dt, and I get y plus 3 
dy equals 1 over t plus 1 dt. And this is now ripe for integration. So y plus 3 dy, the integral thereof, and the integral 1 over t plus 1 dt. So here, here you can think of this as a as a as a as a u substitution, or you can just integrate it term by term, uh, whichever way you want to do it. It doesn't really make a big difference. You may you may produce different appearing answers, but it'll all be um, it would all come down to a different choice of constant is what's going to happen there. So. When we do this integral, we have, I'll just do it term, term by term. That seems to me the more, uh, actually, you know what? I am going to, uh, I'm going I'm to reverse myself here. I've just now decided that I like um, doing this as a U substitution better because I'm thinking of my overarching goal, which is to solve for the Y. And the Y will be easier to solve for if I have, um, if I have only one occurrence of y on the left. So then du would be dy, which is nice. And so then it's integral of u du, which is 1 half u squared. So this is like scratch work for this one. And I'm not going to worry about the plus c. That's going to be 1 half y plus 3 squared. Not going to worry about the plus c uh, in the scratch work here. Over here, over here, it's actually like a separate u substitution. And I'll just keep using u because that's the one that is. Uh, that is most uh, most commonly done. Sometimes we use Ws or things like that, but U is the most common uh, uh, variable to use when doing a substitution, so that's what I'll do. And again, suppressing the plus Cs until the time is right. And so what do I have over here? I have 1 half y plus 3 squared is equal to the natural log of u, or no, sorry, natural log of uh, the absolute value of t plus 1. Once again, u was our fabrication. In fact, we weren't even, uh, we were a little loose in our, in our definition of u. We used it twice for two different things, and uh, typically in math you want to avoid reusing the same variable within the same process uh, more than once to mean different values, but what are you going to do? Either that or use a different letter for a substitution, and I'm not about to do that. All right, so what do we have over here? We have natural log t plus 1 plus, and now finally the constant is, uh, constant is finally making its appearance, so plus c1. And so then now we can get to the business of solving this for y. You can multiply both sides by the 2. I'm not even going to bother writing anymore with the, with the differences between the c1 and the c2. It's just a uh, fine. Well, one more time. But again, this is a this is an element of uh, of of crossing your t's, dotting your i's. That is uh, that is perhaps a little a little bit on the on the namby pamby side. But so be it. Okay, so now get the square root of both sides. And then finally, subtract 3 from both sides, and we'll have our final, final answer.
And once again, the reason why I did this this way rather than term by term was it was uh, uh, looking forward to the fact that I was going to need to um, I was going to need to solve this for the y, and that process is easier if you are able to produce your answer in a way such that there's only one y around. So uh, so if I had done this term by term, I would have had uh, y I would have had one half y squared plus three y which uh, which is a, a slightly different thing from uh, from what we had over here and effectively I would have had to do something complicated to get it down to a single y uh, either using a quadratic formula or completing the square spoiler alert I would have completed the square but uh, but it would have been um, would have been a little bit of a hassle all right so that is uh, so that is how you would uh, how you would do this. Now, let's look at another example. And this is an example based on one of the differential equations that we that we learned about last class. The differential equation that corresponds to uh, that corresponds to Newton's law of cooling. So Newton's law of cooling. All right, so here's the setup. Let's say coffee. Is brewed at 96 degrees Celsius. And then let's say that two minutes later, Two minutes later, it has cooled to 93 degrees Celsius. And the question would be, how long? Uh, so, it, so it is in a, a room that's 20 degrees Celsius. Twenty degrees Celsius, and now how long will it take to reach? Uh, so let's say sixty-eight degrees. So that's the temperature where it'd be uh, good to drink. Okay. So we know that in two minutes, it has gone from 96 degrees Celsius to 93 degrees Celsius. We know that the room temperature is 20 degrees Celsius. We know that it's Newton's law of cooling because it is literally cooling and also because that's the name of the example. And the question will be then, how long will it take to get to 68 degrees Celsius? So let's start with the, uh, start with the differential equation. So dp dt is equal to negative k times t minus a. So remember that was uh, Newton's law of cooling. All right, well here we have some numbers we can put in. So t minus 20, the ambient temperature here is the room temperature, which is 20 degrees Celsius. So. Now, this is a separable differential equation, and so what we can do is uh, we, can, we can separate all the temperature t's uh, to one side, and, the, and then the lowercase t, the time, that'll be on the other side. So there aren't, so there isn't a, any uh, lowercase t floating around here, there's only the dt. So what we can do is we can just divide both sides by t minus 20, multiply both sides by dt, and that'll give us uh, dt over t minus 20 is equal to negative k 
the little dude. All right. Well, then we integrate both sides. Oops. C minus 20. And on the left, what we are going to have is going to be just the natural log with the absolute value of t minus 20. Since we're talking about a thing that is cooling, it wouldn't make sense for it to cool below room temperature. So I could actually drop these absolute values if I wanted. I won't worry about that, though. And if you integrate just a constant with respect to t, that will just turn it into that constant times t plus an arbitrary constant uh, over here. All right, so we have here two pieces of this that are unknown to us. Uh, we have, um, so we have the k and we have the c1. Now, when we, now we have actually two pieces of information here. So we've got essentially a boundary value problem. We've got the temperature that it was first brewed at and then the temperature two minutes later. So that's what we'll use to uh, solve for each of these missing pieces. So essentially, uh, a, a typical rule in math is you need as many pieces of information as you have, uh, as you have constants to solve for. So that's, uh, so that's, that is what's going on here. All right, so I'm going to go e to the power of both sides to cancel out the natural log. So that's going to give us t minus 20. Absolute value over here is equal to e to the negative kt plus c1. And then uh, I'm going to go ahead and rewrite that as e to the negative kt times e to the c1, just so that way um, I can use the, those as property of exponents. And then I will just say then t minus 20, absolute value, equal to c2, e to the negative kt. So c2 here, that is, uh, that is going to be the new constant that you get when you do e to the c1. Whatever the original value of the constant was, now it's a new constant. Now, I can get rid of an absolute value by basically taking, making it plus minus. And that will again just be a new constant. And so then I get the temperature is equal to 20 is equal to that plus 20. So C e to the negative kt plus 20. Now that I've reached the final stage of it being a constant, I, I will drop the subscript and just call it a C. But this problem uh, was not just to find the uh, generic form of the formula but it was to answer a specific question. So we're going to end up actually solving for that C and that K using the additional information that was given to us. So this is in fact a boundary value problem. We are given some pieces of information. We are told what the temperature was when it was first brewed. It was uh, 96. And we're told what the temperature was two minutes later. It was 93. And so those two pieces of information together should be enough to get us the C and the K. General rule in math is if you have two independent pieces of information, that is sufficient to find two missing, uh, two missing parameters or uh, constants or what have you. So we'll just go ahead and get down to it. So using this one, what are we going to get? We're going to get a 96 equals mystery c times e to the zero nice plus 20 so that's just going to equal one which means then c is just going to equal 76. all right well that's nice now we can use that uh in the the equation that we're going to get over here so it's going to be 93 is equal to 76 
times uh, e to the negative mystery k times 2 plus 20. And then we subtract the 20, so we get 73 equals 76 e to the negative 2 times k. The k is the only remaining mystery here, which we can uh, which we can solve this by uh, just dividing. And then taking the natural log. And then finally, uh, dividing by that constant there. Okay, so now what we could do is uh, we can find the approximate value. Unfortunately, that means we're going to have to round, but uh, this is a concrete question asking when it's going to get to 68 degrees, so we can, uh, so we are free to just break the decimal barrier here and, uh, and just go into the world of the approximate from the idealized world of the exact. So, I'll just get any old calculator and it will give you a uh, It'll give you this to whatever amount of precision it is programmed to do. So, 20137. So, I didn't want to round it very aggressively because this is, uh, this is going into an exponent on e, and um, and small rounding can uh, can get out of hand relatively quickly when you're talking about exponential expressions. All right, but let's remember what this is all for. It's all for finding out the time at which the coffee reaches 68 degrees centigrade. So, so what do we have here for our overall formula? It was negative kT, so it means negative 0 0.020137 t plus 20. And now I want to actually go ahead and set it equal to 68 and solve for the t. And to solve for the t, we just peel away layer, layer after layer from the outside in until there's nothing but a t left. So I subtract 20 from both sides. And then you take stock and you realize if I divide by that, we'll have 48 over 76 on the left, e to the negative 0 0.020137. Now the thing on the left, it can be uh, it can be reduced a little bit if you're into that kind of thing. We can see that the top and the bottom are both divisible by 4, for one thing. But beyond that, it doesn't really make any difference, and we're going to put this in a calculator anyway, so why bother? So now what do we have? Negative 0.20137t equals the natural log. So we're just kind of going through some very, uh, very stereotypical steps here in the process. Take the natural log to cancel the exponential. That's what it's for. And so then you divide by that, and you get t is approximately equal to. And notice that number is already there on my calculator, so I might go ahead and avail myself of that. So natural log 48 divided by 76 divided by answer. The only thing I'm missing when I do that is uh, the negative, but I can remember to put that in. So what do we have? Negative 22.8 minutes. So, oops, 
Oops, not negative. All right. I said I was smart enough to remember to put the negative or to deal with the negative, and then I quickly, uh, quickly gave myself the lie on that one. Oops. So 22.8 minutes. So should be positive. Uh, I, this was just missing the negative in my laziness and not typing, not wanting to type out that num that uh, that decimal again. I had to remember to uh, to account for the negative. Okay. So. Was a word problem. We can give it a word answer. The coffee will be at 68 degrees Celsius after about 22.8 minutes. Okay. So that is how we can use the technique of separation of variables to solve the separable differential equation that comes from Newton's law of cooling uh, with a couple of specifics, such as the initial temperature, the temperature at a different point. That together should be enough information for you to solve all the missing pieces. It's effectively a boundary value problem then and uh, and one that we can solve according to the techniques we've learned so that'll do it for this first uh, this first session of math uh, 256 so join me next class and we will look at the look at the geometry of differential equations and and we may get a visit from our old friend leonard euler so uh, so stay tuned for that all right well till then bye